Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Manager and I'll be your host today. I want to thank our sponsor today, Cross Border Weavers, um, and they're doing this in memory of Nancy Peck. Nancy was the HGA president actually when I first came on board and she was just so funny and just very excited about what she was doing. Um, super, super nice. Oh, an incredible weaver, and she is missed by many. Nancy, I hope you're watching and you enjoy today's program. And thank you, Cross Border Weavers, for being the sponsor today. It's nice to hear and see Nancy again. Uh, as always, if you'll do your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat, I can see the questions if they're in the Q&A. I can't always catch them if they're in the chat. We love your comments. Keep those coming. Today, we are excited to uh, interview Janie Simpson. Um, Janie has got a long history of weaving. She began weaving in the eight, 1980s, 1880s. Sorry, Janie, you're not that old. While living in Connecticut, she taught weaving at the Wesleyan Potters for many years. Janie is the past president, apprentice, waiver of distinction, lifetime member of the Ham Weavers Guild of Connecticut. She's now in Michigan as she's full time and she's currently teaching at her studio, The Barn in Gaylord. I think we'll get to see some of that in the background. Great space. She relishes the aha moments when new weavers throw a shuttle for the first time and return to learn more. She is newly appointed VP Programs Chair of the Michigan League of Hand Weavers. She has presented many workshops and lectures on deflected double weave, finishing and embellishing handwovens, knitted beaded bags, sakiori, and weaving with fibers uh, of Micronesia. Her articles and videos can be found in Long Thread Media and Complex Weavers publications. She is privileged to be a student of many outstanding teachers. Janie strives to create one-of-a-kind pieces using a variety of yarns and weave structures on many types of looms. And we are excited to have you here today, Janie. Hey. Hey, hi. Welcome. You staying warm up Thank in you. Michigan? It's very cold. It's cold down here. So if it's cold down here in Atlanta, it must be awful up there in Michigan. <laughs> it it's around 10. Oh, wow. That's what we're supposed to get. Keep that cold mm -hmm. air up there. Um, so our first question is, on this nice cold day, what is your favorite tea? I I am enjoying, um, in a polka dot mug, uh, green tea Ooh. with lemon and ginger. All right. So how did you get started in fiber? Well, I, I grew up in the Midwest, in Evanston, Illinois, under the scrutiny of my mother and grandmother. And uh, they were fibrous from day one. They were always knitting, sewing, crocheting, needlepointing, and so yarn and everything was all around me. So I think it was in my genes. But um, in seventh grade, um, I'm in my 70s, so this is a long time ago, uh, home ec classes were available to us, and um, I met my first loom. It was a little <laughs> tiny structo, and I wove on it and made a narrow band with um, sticks and beads and in cotton, and I was just in awe of this little machine. And I said, I'll go back to it sometime. And it was many, many years later, um, after I got through school and all of those things. And um, my father bought me my very first Leclerc four shaft loom. I still have it today. I still weave on it today. And um, I, I've just been weaving on and off for um, over 40 years. I, I can't give it up. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of people going, Structo, we love that Structo loom. That's great. That was the loom you started with. Little workhorse. It is. It is. Um, you are well known for deflected double weave, and we have a sample of your beautiful work here. 
So for our newbies, can you just give a brief overview of what is deflected double weave? I don't want it to be a workshop. And then talk some about how that kind of drew you in. What was the attraction of that for you? Well, I I love the texture um, in deflected double weave. I, I really like texture in all kinds of weaving. Um, I was introduced to this weave structure through some publications in um, by Interweave Press, um, in Handwoven Magazine. Um, Madeline Vanderhoot was uh, publishing quite a bit of information on the structure, and it was intriguing. I I really liked the way it looked. I liked um, the layers to it. I liked the fact that it was really um, rather simple in structure. It was just wet floats and warp floats and some plain weave holding it together and a lot of neat interactions between the layers. So um, between her articles and being introduced to deflected double weave by one of my teachers, Lori Audio, who I see is here today, um, I, I just started to play with it. And um, the structure itself is it's been around a long time. I think there's an old colonial shawl pattern that was published in um, Mary Miggs Atwater recipe book in 1957. And it was also um, published in the last chapter of Carol Strickler's eight chef pattern book. Um, it's not, they weren't called deflected double weave, but it is the structure and it's probably it even goes back further than that. So um, I I just started playing with it and had fun with it. And I thought, well, I can do some things with it because it's so versatile and I can weave plain weave and I can, um, I can weave a double, traditional double uh, cloth on it, more uh, two layers, or you could actually leave, weave four layers if you wanted to. You only need the two shafts per layer. Um, this scarf was woven with um, uh, one of the active yarns um, for the neck area. And um, I really want to explore that more because I think it just makes a very comfortable scarf that sits on your neck and doesn't fall off your neck. <laughs> um, so that has layers and, and then deflected double weave just around the neck. Now, would you, you talk a little bit what active yarn is? I know it's going to pop up here. Um, active yarn is, um, it's a yarn that was sold for a long time um, by um, the presenter last week, um, Giovanna Imperia. And um, now Lunatic Fringe is carrying those yarns. And it is, uh, it's a yarn that is uh, a combination of either wool, or silk or cotton um, with an, an elasticized or highly twisted yarn. So it it has a lot of energy to it and it, um, it crimps and pulls in and um, has a mind of its own. <laughs> yeah, I think kind of the basic, for me, when I think of deflected double weave, it's double weave, yes, but that the layers aren't, solid both of them usually are not solid weave sometimes there are more open spaces is that kind of a good definition not they're, all the time, they're con be. they're connected yeah so where where the plain weave is is where they're connected the layers are connected and then the floats are on either the top side of the fabric or the bottom side of the floats. fabric that's what i should have said floats mm -hmm. <laughs> and the connections don't need to be plain weave they can be something else too but and then I that just we'll allows that it to later. it can move mm -hmm. the the yarns can kind of wiggle and move and it's always fun I thought that when you take it off the loom and take it off tension sometimes you get a surprise they may do things that you aren't ready for and it's kind of an exciting magic <laughs> it, it it's magical and when you wet finish it it um, really changes well, your first career was as a scientist. And again, I have to remark how many weavers either have a science or a math background. 
And I can really see the parallel between science and art in your work because your exploration of deflected double weave has a real methodical approach to it of discovering, pushing the limits of the structure. Um, and we have a couple of examples to show the unique use of deflected double weave. So would you, when we're looking at these, could you explain why these are so unique in your work? Um, and, and where does that passion to explore come from? Uh, I'd love to, I'd love to. Um, I always wanted to be a scientist, always. And I was fortunate, I, I spent my summers up in Northern Michigan on old family property and I was alone a lot and I explored everything I could from the lake to the field, to the mouse nest, to you name it. And um, I just was always interested in you know, how, how everything worked and how things were put together and how things grew and all of that. Um, I, I just love science and I loved math. So um, I do approach my my work. I I don't even know if I was really aware that I was doing the same thing. But when I weave, I take pretty much the same steps as I used to take in um, scientific research when I was working, and um, I take it one step at a time. I you know make an observation and think about you know how it might happen on my loom and then I do an experiment and then I analyze my results. So I think I've just always been, um, that's the way I learn and um, it works for me. I um, I like to plan things. So um, this piece in this picture is um, actually on a 16 shaft loom and um, it is deflected double weave. It's an, in a very simple point twill uh, design. Um, the, the unique thing about this piece is that you can see in the picture the diagonal lines where the twill lines are. So what I did was um, every place that there had been plain weave, I put a 2-2 two -two twill in there. And that doubled the number of shafts that I needed. So um, fortunately I had a 16 shaft um, AVL ava available and um, I was able to um, draft it out and have 2212 where plain weave used to be. And the reason that I chose the 2212 was because um, the salvages are unique in deflected double weave. There are two sets of salvages one for the outer yarn and one for the inner yarn. And I wanted to be able to catch my edges on both of those uh, sets. And 2 2 twill is, is, is one way structure that I knew I could catch my salvage as long as I started on the right, the correct side. I'll say, I won't say the right or the left side, but the correct side. So um, that had a whole different feel than deflected double weave that has um, the plain weave kind of binding it together and connecting the layers. Well, this is just beautiful. Now, this is three layers or four layers? Um, this is this is three layers okay. around the neck and then two layers. Um, and then, well, on the shoulders there, there are um, areas of deflected double weave. And then down the arms, there are two layers. So um, this came about because um, there was a draft in Marian Stubininski's book. And um, it just caught my eye because uh, the deflected double weave, and you can see it in the lower right-hand corner, mm -hmm. the deflected double weave on the top was so uniquely different than under underneath it. Um, and you can see one layer on the top, it was the red and the black dominant and underneath it, it was um, that light sort of light beige, a much lighter look to it. 
And so I I tried this I tried this pattern, and it's a it's actually a four color, four layer, deflected double weave. So there are four salvages, to take care of. So you're diving your shuttle, um, usually three out of four times, or you're raising your shuttle. You're manipulating your shuttle to get to catch the edge, and um, I was intrigued with this pattern. So um, when I was playing with it, I had my my layer work um, down the arms with just two layers and then connections on the shoulders. And then um, around the neck, what I did was I separated out the wool silk, which is the tan and the red, from the other yarn that I was using, which is um, tensile. And I kept the ten cells together, but it, because the wool silks were woolly and kind of held together better, I left them. I let them be their own layer. I hope this makes sense. But anyway, <laughs> in the middle of that, you'll see around the neck there, you have two wool silk colors, and then you have a ten cell blend in between it, and you can decide which uh, which colors you want to wear in the front and who's going to be in the back of your neck. And then down your arms, you have um, just the two layers, which those are combinations of a wool silk and a tensel. So in this scarf, you're actually getting five unique um, fabrics plus your deflected double weave on your shoulders. So it, it was fun. J.D., you crack me up. Do you have any idea what an incredible weaver you are? <laughs> I mean, I would be so excited to do any of those layers all by themselves. But the idea that you weave them all at once is just amazing. Somebody commented that you got to take a class with Cheney. Now we know why. We want to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Another really amazing um, shawl that we're going to show is the V-shaped shawl. And I've seen it in a magazine. I've seen this technique done in a magazine where you're basically weaving on the loom and then you're connecting it to another piece that you've woven. Um, and, and again, this is a wonderful example of taking two things and combining them together. Um, how did you come across this? What was the idea with this? Well, what, ha what happened with this project was... Um, and I think this was the second one that I did. Um, oh, I see little hearts there. That's cute. I um, I really had just intended to try to weave a V-shaped shawl um, uh -huh. because I'd never done that before. There we go. And, That's a good shawl. Um, yeah. So when you, you think about deflected double weave, it um, that structure is threaded, usually threaded in uh, a block sequence, but it's threaded odd even. And so when you have odd even, you, you have all these opportunities to weave it as plain weave or weave it as layers or weave it as, oh my gosh, crimp weave or shibori. Or, I mean, you have just tons of possibilities. So what happened to me was I had woven uh, a scarf and I had all this warp left and I thought, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to teach myself how to do this. And I talked to my friend, Susan Morrison in Connecticut, and um, she had done several of these and I thought, okay, I'll just go for it. So I, I wove the first panel and you can see that, um, well, you weave the first panel and then you leave a whole lot of warp, maybe 30 inches of warp because you need you need enough warp length to weave back into your next panel and also have fringe. So at that point I'd had, I'll call it panel A off to the side. And then I wove the next long piece of plain weave and I was getting ready to put them back together and combine them. And I said, hey, wait a minute. You know, I I have deflected double weave here. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not going to weave plain weave if I can weave something else. And um, so I just wove, I wove it in the structure that I had threaded on the loom. 
and wove my ends one at a time. I just used my fingers. You can use a long stick shuttle um, and got it to line up. You really had to watch, watch your beat very carefully. And I suspended, um, you can see in the pictures, I suspended the warp um, from my ot light. I just had it sort of in a ponytail. And I. the most important thing, if you ever try this, is um, in any weave structure, put a, the white thread in is put something in in the plane weave so that you can pick your threads one by one in the order that they were originally on the loom. That's the most important tip I can give you uh, is to keep the order going. So I just ended up with um, with this. It's amazing. It's absolutely it's beautiful. Fun. It was fun. Um, you're going to be teaching deflected double weave at um, Convergence this summer in um, in Wichita, and it's going to be deflected double weave connections, layers, and pockets. And one of the things that I think people love about double weave is that you can make pockets or pouches, you know, and there's something so um, attractive to people to be able to do that, especially a pocket that you can put things in and this beautiful scarf where you've made a pouch and that you could take the scarf back through. So what is it about that that is so inviting for people to make and for you to teach? Well, I I think it's just magic. I double weave is magical, and um, the more you learn about it, the it it just becomes more interesting. Um, there's so many possibilities, uh, and I, you know, I love Jennifer Moore's book and going through her sampler and weaving things that are connected on both edges and become a tube and weaving pockets and weaving pouches and uh, weaving something that's just connected on one side. I mean, she takes you through all those steps. And um, my my pockets, um, I, I really should just call slits or openings because um, in my scarves and shawls, when I want to pass one end of it, of the item through the other, through this slit, and like this picture, um, ca calling it a pocket has become confusing over the years. So now I'm calling it an opening or a slit to do something like that. Um, I also find with deflected double weave that as you're weaving, depending on your um, threading sequence, your block sequence, you can find um, little pouches that open up where you can insert an embellishment, you know, a a diamond, a, a button, a coin, a feather, um, a something to embellish your work. And um, I've always been interested in adding a little glitz and things like that. Um, so you could, you could leave this as a true pocket that you could maybe put a cell phone in or car keys or something like that. Um, I usually, I usually just have them as an opening, but they're fascinating. They're fascinating. And, and the other thing that you can do with something like this, this technique with the opening is if you make the opening wider, um, wide enough to go over your head, then you can slip the scarf over your head. Um, so you just need them wide enough to get your hand through. So oh, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, like a cowl. It yeah. would be like a cowl. Yeah. 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 Um, one thing about, I was curious, I wanted you to talk some about is the use of color in deflected double weave because with the structure, you are weaving over, under, over, under, but there's also a lot of layering on top. And like you said, where it's, it's more open and it's, um, it, it has more space and then the colors will do play out differently. I thought this was a gorgeous, you know, being able to see the colors in the background and the front. So when you started working more with deflected double weave, did you have to kind of look at color differently when you're putting things together? Um, I, I did experiment a lot with that. Um, and I, and I did find 
uh, you you do have to pay more attention because there's a lot going on with with the structure itself. Um, I've often thought about teaching deflected double weave in black and white Ooh. so that we could get away from color and just learn the structure first. Um, but no one likes that idea uh, except me. Um, I just find that um, there's a lot going on with it. And so I tend to um, work with more subdued colors. Um, I work with analogous colors. And I also work with, if I'm going to dye my warps, I'll, I'll work with close to complementary colors, not exactly complements. And, and I will blend those dyes so that um, all my dye, all my little dye pots have a little bit of both color. And, and then I get some very muted um, coloration going on. So I find in all weaving, if my structure is really intense and dominant, then I will cut back on my color use. Um, I really love the soft colors and I love the the muddy colors. Um, I really like that. Um, and if the structure is bland, um, you can have more excitement with your color. So I think you have to play with it. I have a lot of disasters <laughs> and um, they're in the bottom of the plastic bins. Um, but I learned from them. So um, the four, that four color... Uh, four layer work that I did um, with Marion Stubininski's pattern um, that had such a dominant uh, change with color on the front and the back that um, a couple of those just didn't turn out at all. And you, I had to be really careful with with the color selection for for that um, because they were so uniquely different. Well, I'm I'm sorry that you had. A failure but i think everybody's going oh good it isn't just me oh. <laughs> you know jay can have failures i can too yay well we're going to kind of shift off of deflected double weave and i want you to talk a little bit about uh sakiori which i hope i pronounced right and first for those of us who don't know much about it would you explain what it is and then why did you pursue this well, sure. I saki ori. Uh, saki means to rip, and ori means to weave in Japanese. And so saki ori is actually rip and weave, rip and reweave. It's just um, it's a very very ancient technique, and it was a way of repurposing old cloth, mm -hmm. which they had to do. And we do more and more of that today too. So um, my my grandmother and my mother loved Oriental art and textiles and furniture, and um, I, I was with them as much as I could be. And so they had old kimono that were really tattered, um, not wearable, and I started to. Um, I started to take the kimono apart and I learned a lot about the construction of the kimono. John Marshall also writes about kimono, you know, wonderful things about kimono. He's such an expert with that. And it's, it's re it was really fun because um, you can take, they used to take kimono apart and then wash it and then put it back together. But it's um, constructed in a way that there are very, very few cuts to the fabric and um, you end up with large pieces of fabric because they've only been turned in and then stitched and they're very usable. So you get you get a lot of yardage out of old kimono. And um, I, I just wanted to reweave it and see what I could do with it. So these are samples of old silk kimono that um, you know, I sat with a little tiny ripper at night and undid these pieces and just loved to have that in my hands. And and then I made um, a con continuous strip so that I had yards and yards and yards to work with. 
And then um, on the one on the right, the black one, you can see the, the binding on it is the kimono silk itself. Hmm. And then I embellished it with um, a hand-painted bead. And so I often did that. I would I would hem it with the original fabric and try and, you know, even the, well, the one on the left too, you can see the original silk and then what I did with it when I, when I wove it. So I was just having fun repurposing <laughs> old stuff. <laughs> what can I say? Now, does it have to be a kimono for it to be um, secure? No, it because... doesn't. It can be okay. your t-shirt. It can be, um, you know, it can be anything. Um, I like to use these old fabrics. I have done quite a bit with sari silk. Um, in fact, uh, one of the pictures in the very beginning of the of those runners are done with um, sari silk, mm. which is from India. So I know you when I do was it with... looking it up and trying to learn more about it, some of the definitions were like kimono. So I didn't know if you go away from a kimono, like it's a different name or something. So I don't think so. I think Western um, Westerners now are doing more sake ori. Um, there, there are several people in the states that are are teaching it. Mm -hmm. um, my, uh, I, I, I haven't seen too many of those pieces. I, I did borrow one piece from Tom Nisley a long time ago, um, that was an original sake ori piece from Japan and. Mm -hmm. Um, it was very heavy and very tightly woven. Um, I tried always, I'm not a rug weaver. I'm not a, a, a beater. Um, I like to find structure that is compatible with the material that I'm using as weft. So for my sake ori, I, um, I used mainly the canvas weave patterns on four shafts. Mm -hmm. um, that are found in Marguerite Davison's um, Hand Weavers book, the green book that I think most of us have. Um, the, it's a canvas weave is based on a, a lace structure. So there are um, a lot of ways to end up with a light and airy um, textile that shows off your weft and you can space out, you can vary things in the in the read so that your set is compatible with the heaviness or the lightness of your weft. So it's a lot of fun. Well, you were talking about how your your mother and your grandmother, I think, were interested in all things Japanese. Um, and I know you really have an interest in woodcuts. Did that come from them? And then then you moved on to the Saki or was there other connections for you to Japan? Uh, I, I think my love of all those things um, came from my grandmother and my mother. And it was it was just in them. They they loved collecting those little boxes that had 14 drawers. And um, every time I went to my grandmother's, there was just something more to you know, open up and, and look inside and see what what little treasure was in there. So, um, yeah, I think. I it, Japanese woodblock prints. They they collected that kind of thing um, to hang on the wall, and I I I don't think I don't recall really looking at what was going on in the print. You know, was it was it a drama? Was it a man and a woman? Was it you know what was going on? But the colors were attracted me, so I. I love the the subtle colors of the Japanese woodblock prints, so that that really influences my color choice um, a lot. And also, like going outside and taking a walk, <laughs> being outside, I like to be outside. So um, that influences nature influences me quite a bit. But um, I think the sake ori just kind of bloomed when stacks of kimono were building up and I'm like, oh, I'm I was into recycling and sustainability and you know let's repurpose um some of this pretty silk. Well you you're so well known as a teacher and highly respected. And you had a statement, you made a mis um, a statement and I want you to talk some about this. And it 
It was so simple, but I think it's so powerful. You said you do not need to understand everything about weaving. The more you understand, the more you can make it personal. Would you expand on that? Sure. I, I've taught for many years and, um, in the beginning I was like, oh, I want, I want everybody to get it. <laughs> they need to get this. And then I realized that you didn't need to get it and you could still enjoy weaving. So you could come in with a recipe and with a little assistance from the teacher classmate, you could weave a beautiful table runner. You could weave a towel. You could weave a scarf or whatever and enjoy the process and figure it out and end up with something wonderful and not really, not really understand how it worked. And it took me a while to get over my, my thing about, I want you to understand this and beat it in. And we're going to have, you know, I'll show you on the blackboard how it works but you don't, you don't have to, but it's like cooking and you know, we all cook. And sometimes we don't understand what the baking powder did, uh, but we can cook, we can follow a recipe and cook and get a good outcome. So I, I think I backed off on trying to, you know, push that kind of understanding on everyone because it wasn't for everyone, but when you do understand it, Oh, when you you get that weaving's all about what's staying up and what's staying down and what you can control once you understand it is endless. It's enormous. And then you can make it, then you can make it your own. You can personalize it. You can you can find a summer and winter block that you can make, you can put it down on the border if you want to. You can put some hem stitching around it if you want to. I mean, you can just push it, push the boundaries. So um, I just, I love the fact that you can, you can weave and enjoy weaving without having to know everything about it. Um, or, or you can, you can know everything about it and um, do more with it and do more original work. Kind of refers back to your um, bio at the beginning about those aha moments of when when people finally do get it. I know I'm that way, that when something that's been told to me a thousand times and it finally sinks in, it's like, oh, OK, now I get it. You know, rather than just doing what the pattern says, now I understand it. So, yeah, I understand what you're saying there. So you studied for four years. We talked about Laurie Audio, uh, but you studied four years with her through her exploration in advanced weaving. Um, first, would you share with those who don't know Laurie and about her program? And then second, why did you commit to such an intense program for so long? Well, um, sure. I, Lori. Um, <laughs> don't blush, Lori, a... while you're listening <laughs> She's a, a master weaver. She's a scientist. She's a writer. She's an editor. She's a leader of many guilds. And she's an incredible teacher, encouraging and patient. Um, I, I really was fortunate um, to have taken her class. And um, I, I was thinking about this. I, I can't remember exactly when I first met Lori, but I do remember, I do remember taking a class with her a long time ago at Convergence um, in Grand Rapids. That was a long time wow. ago, probably twenty years ago or more. And um, at that point in my weaving career, because um, I got off to a slow start, um, I was signing up for classes based on who was teaching the class, not the topic, because I'd been following the literature and I was like, oh, I need to meet that person. I thought, look, look at what they're doing and how, you know, I'm reading their articles and like, I need to meet so-and-so and so-and-so. Well, Lori was one of those. And um, 
Dorme Keesby was another person that I just had to meet and James Kohler and Catherine Ellis. I, I mean, there's a long list of people that I wanted to meet. And fortunately, I took a lot of workshops and could meet a lot of these people. But um, it was after that class that I came home and I said, oh, my gosh, I could learn so much more about weaving, so much more. And um, so that's um, that's what happened there. I um, applied for her class and I, I was scared and oh. I didn't I didn't feel that I, I knew enough and I didn't. Um, I found out all the things that I didn't know, and I found out where to find out about those things I didn't know. And so it was just, it was a great opportunity. It was a um, a wonderful group of weavers who are really interested in weaving, dedicated to it, and sharing um, the class with them and the experience. And um, the four years went by so fast, so fast. And I'm so grateful. She just opened, she opened my mind to um, looking at weave structures differently. She showed us so many variants, um, so many ways we can push a weave structure and didn't give us recipes, but gave oh. us the knowledge and the curiosity to um, you know stand up to that weave structure and say, what can I make you do? So thank you, Lori. I like that. I like that. Now was the was this meeting in person? Was the class in person or was it online or in person? Oh, in nice. person. We um yes, we um we drove um I, well I drove from Old Lyme, Connecticut up to Orange, Massachusetts and um, one of our students came from Ann Arbor, 14 hours. <laughs> it was worth it. We, we went in bad weather, good weather. We, we, we showed up. Wow. We showed up. It, it was fabulous. Oh, I mm -hmm. can't imagine. Wow. Well, everybody's asking who Lori is. We've put it in the chat. Um, it's Laurie Audio, A-U-T-I-O. So if you're all interested, you can to look her up. And then people are commenting how they love Laurie also. Um, the I want you to think about, picture the Janie Simpson retrospect of your work. So what kind of reaction do you want people to have when they come into this exhibit and see all your different amazing work? Well, I I was more or less a, a turtle in the very beginning. I, um, I remember weaving when my second son was two with two or three golden retrievers running around. And I was weaving a lot of plain weave and two, two, twill. And I was enjoying it. Uh, I was very happy to be doing that. Um, so I think what they would see if I had everything lined up um, from all the years is I think they'd see a learning curve from very simple to more complex and more complex and more complex weaving. And um, and I and I think that that would be probably maybe common to many of us um, who have been weaving a long time. I've had students who have a very steep learning curve, and I'm just blown away by it. I I watch that and I go, how did you learn all of that so quickly? But you know, I had a life going on and a busy husband and kids and dogs and parents to take care of. And and so, yeah, I did what I could. But I learned a lot along the way. I made I make mistakes. I learn I learn way more from my mistakes than I do from my successes. Um, I sort of relish a mistake when it happens in a class to go, oh, this is a teaching moment. We can all learn from this. And you don't even have to make the the mistake yourself. You can, you know, get onto somebody else's bandwagon. Um, but I think that 
I would hope that they would acknowledge my commitment to weaving and learning and exploring. And I I hope that they would notice that I, I try, I strive to be original and I like to be technically proficient and I'll do things over and over again. I'll change, I'll change sets, I'll change whatever to make it what I want it to be. But I think, you know, I think most of all, if um, if there was a show like that, if it inspired people to start their path in weaving or continue their path in weaving and know that there's um, an infinite amount to learn and to do, um, you'll never do it all in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. I think that would mean the most to me. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I think there should be a retrospect. So I'll, I'll watch for it. We're going to see that someday. We have tons of questions. Everybody has questions. So I'm going to try to get through um, as many as I can. I apologize to y'all. I won't be able to get to all of them. But um, the first one I think is a good question is, could you recommend a book for beginners? And I'm assuming it's about deflected double weave. You did mention um, Madeline Vanderhoot. Um, who are some other people that you, there's good books out there to, to learn from? Well, I, I would definitely start with the, um, the interweave press, um, book that's out. It's downloadable, okay. um, on deflected double weave. That's a good book. Um, Lisa Hill, uh, hmm. has, she's been teaching deflected double weave a long time. She has, I believe a monograph. I don't, I don't know if it's available to everyone or you have to take her classes um i now mm, you have a video on interweave right oh yeah yeah you could long thread yeah, media, yeah, long thread media did yeah. a, a video a year ago a year ago um it's two parts it, it's a two-part video but there's a lot published on it now um right yeah you know, off the bat i'm trying i i would I, I think I'd start with um, the publications by Madeline. Okay. Uh, people are asking about this, the yarn sold at Lunatic Fringe. Um, and they don't, they want to know the name. There isn't really a name per se, is there? Or... Um, it's kind of known by the name Coco Elastic. Okay. Um, and if you go to Lunatic Fringe and uh, look at their active yarns, it's under active yarns in their okay. and on their website. All right. Um, I, it does come in different uh, elasticity, so there'll be a fifty percent or a thirty percent. Oh, okay. Um, you can get a you know super stretchy kind or not so stretchy. And Lunatic Fringe, the staff there is wonderful. So if you forget the name, you can call them, and if you tell them what you're looking for, they'll know. They'll know. Yeah, active. Say active Janie yarn. sent you. You know. <laughs> Um, somebody wants to know, in Deflect the Double Weave, can you use standard floating selvages to connect the two layers at the edge? Love your work, Janie. Oh, that's yes, from Sarah Salson. You. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. There she is. Um, I've never put floating selvages on my Deflected Double Weave. Um, and that's not to say that you can't. Um, I love the double salvages. I love, I, I call them flanges. <laughs> and I know Anita Osterhock, when she was at, at the barn doing the video, she's like, what are these flanges you're talking about? And I said, oh, here they are. Aren't they cool? So, <laughs> you know, I like the double, I emphasize the double um, salvage and I look for that and make sure that it happens without loops happening. Um, I do believe in a few of Madeline's patterns. Um, she ignores that second salvage and she she does weave. Um, she manipulates the shuttles in a way. It's in one of her articles so that her her salvages, there's just one one salvage going on. So I but I personally haven't done that. I have not put a floating salvage on. Um, this is a good question. Uh, it's from Michaela, of course, Macintosh. She would ask this. 
Um, what is the difference between sakio and um, rag rug weaving? Hmm. Technically, I I think that's probably a good question for Tom Nisley. Okay. Um, I do. I know. Uh, you know, rag. Uh, sake ori is just uh, it's this old Japanese technique that they were using um, to recycle all of their scraps, including the threads that were on the floor. Wow. It, you were just putting everything back into um, into the the warp to reweave cloth that then you would make into clothing and keep yourself warm. I mean, it was just really a purposeful thing. You know, rag rug weaving, you know, you're, you're, you might be cutting old rags, you might be cutting new sheets. I mean, I don't, I don't really know technically what, I, what's real different. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, you know, the weft, the weft is cloth. So there certainly must be some, you know, similarities. But yeah, I would like like to know what maybe Tom ha would have to say about that. Me too. I never thought about it until until Michaela asked that. And was a like, good oh, that's question. A good question. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sharon wants to know how did you document? Did you document your work from the beginning? Are you a documenter? Do you keep journals? That kind of thing. I'm a binder girl. Everything's oh, okay. in a bind. Yeah. I have some sketchy notes. I used Hand Weavers Guild of Connecticut project sheets for years and years and years and um, would put my all my little scribbled notes in into a sleeve. So, yes, I have a lot of binders. Mm -hmm. Well, Claudia Coco said, there are three of us interested in a black and white class on structure. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Class is almost full. There you go. <laughs> there are tons of people asking about how you cut the strips for the sakiori, but um, um, do you cut them? Do you tear them? That kind of thing. Um, I, I do the, a tubular method for that. Um, I'm cutting, I'm going to cut strips, um, not on the bias, but on the grain. So I will take a rectangular piece of kimono and do a close zigzag so that I have, I have a tube. And, and then I take a rotary cutter and a mat and a plexiglass guide you know, quilters tools. And I, and I cut usually about a half inch strips right up, but not through the whole tube. I hope that makes sense. So you're just going up to the edge and then you cut on the diagonal, you cut the first strip and then you cut over one and over one and you end up with yards and yards and yards of um, weft material that's still sewn together. Um, it's a it's a sewing it's a quilter's trick. Yeah, you can see it on uh, if you Google it, you can see it on YouTube where they show you how to do that. Mm -hmm. So you're right; it just gives you one long. It's like peeling an apple, you know. It is it, a <laughs> it little bit gives like you that. One yeah. long piece. Nice. Well, I am so excited you were here today, Janie. I hope you enjoyed it. You did, did. beautifully. Thank you so much. <laughs> We're excited to have had you here today. And again, I want to thank, I want to tell y'all, be sure you check out her website, uh, JennySimpson.com. You can see all kinds of information there, learn about her classes, all those questions that you have about how to do things. There you go. Janie Simpson's class, you need to sign up for it. She'll be at Convergence. Well, I hope I get to see you there and uh, we'll enjoy uh, hearing more about your next adventures. Um, I want Thanks. to thank Cross Cross Border uh, Weavers for sponsoring today's episode in memory of Nancy Peck. Nancy, I hope you enjoyed the show. I was glad to have you here. Thank you, Cross Borders. It was wonderful to have you be a sponsor today. We also want to remind you that if you want to be a sponsor, you can 
your guild or you or your business, you can sponsor also. And you can go online and go to, um, on our website, you can go to Spinning and Weaving, I'm Spinning and Weaving, uh, Textiles and Tea, and you can see where you can uh, get a sponsorship. You can purchase a sponsorship. Just to, you know, you choose the date you want. And uh, we would love to have you all be a sponsor of Textiles and Tea. Um, we've got some more um, events coming up. Uh, one of them is Small Expressions 2023 is on the road. Um, it is traveling around the U.S. And it is currently at um, Gadkin Fiber Center in North Carolina. If you're in the area, please stop by and see it. If you're interested to see it and hear a juror's talk, we're going to do that on, online. It's going to be um, a virtual juror's talk. You can learn more about the exhibit. And wouldn't it be great to watch that and then be able to go see the exhibit in North Carolina? It's going to be Wednesday, January the 31st at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the juror is Alice Wood, and she will discuss her selections, why she selected it, and talk about the different aspects of the different works. Um, it's $2 for students, individuals, households, and professional artists. Uh, and then $15 for everyone else. You can go online to weavespindie.org and sign up, or you can give us a call and we'll be glad to take care of that for you. Again, Small Expressions 2023 uh, is on the road and it's gonna be at Yadkin and you can see it on, um, on the virtual um, jurors talk. We look forward to seeing you there. Also, the Guild uh, Development Retreat, January 27th. I want to remind you all, um, if you're in a guild and you are interested in learning more, um, this guild was set up, I mean, this guild, this program was set up to offer guild members the, the opportunity to learn more from each other, um, learn about leadership, um, learning from each other, how to strengthen their guild, expand their guild. And it's just a great platform, platform for you all to share ideas and what you've done and what works and what doesn't, that sort of thing. Great topics, hosting a guild sale, diversity and inclusion, developing your board, keeping up and staying relevant in a technological world. Great topics. And we'll have some wonderful panelists um, to talk about those. If you want more information, you can go online to weavespendie.org. If you're an affiliate guild, you can have four people attend. If you want to attend on your own and you're a member, it's $20. So $50 for non-members. Um, again, it's a one day online. It's January the 27th and we hope you will join us. If you, we want to thank everyone for their support and keeping these programs going. Your donations keep uh, Careers in Textiles, Textiles and Tea, the Guild Retreat, those programs happen because of donations from you all. And we thank you. Uh, if you would like, you can go online and join and or donate at weavespindie.org. We appreciate the support we you all give to us. Next week, oh, if you've missed episodes, you can go online and watch them. You can either watch them on the HGA Facebook page or you can go to the HGA YouTube. Uh, if you want, you can subscribe to the YouTube and then you'll get a notice when a new one's uplo uploaded. Uh, again, next week we have Brianna Bibbs. We're excited to have her here. I hope you have a wonderful week and uh, all of you who are in the snow areas and that's all the way from Michigan down to here. Stay safe, stay warm, and we'll see you next week. Happy tea.